Welcome to Academy Dialogues. My name is Sean Finney. I am honored to guide this conversation today with three individuals that I believe are shaping our culture through film, and that is writer-director Gina prince Bythewood, Oscar winner T.J. Martin, and the incomparable, incredible Delroy Lindo. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. First, I mean, when we say it's good to see you now, it just takes on a whole new level based on where we are in the world. So first, I want to just check in. How are you doing? Gina, we can start with you. How are you doing? How are you managing in this time? It's so funny because that's my go-to. It's like you say, you know, how are you? And uh, it's such a loaded question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very scary time right now. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was saying that it felt like a hopeful time given that it felt that true change was finally coming. Um, that in this moment, instead of people being defensive, people were finally understanding uh, what we've been fighting for for, for all these years and, and hearing us. Um, but right now I've kind of gone back to it, it feeling like a scary time. And I think what's uh, indicative is uh, my son who's 19, mm. got pulled over by police for the first time. And uh, when? the fact when? that- When, Gina? Uh, when? Uh, when? when? Yeah, when was your uh, son pulled over? Two days ago. Wow. And um, the fact that my husband and I didn't even have the luxury of being able to be angry at him for getting a speeding ticket, our first question was, you know, are you okay? And then he survived it. And that, the fact that that's where our mind goes uh, is, is pretty insane. Wow. And Delroy, I know you also have a son. So I'm sure uh, when... 19, I have a 19 year old, yeah. So when you hear that as a, as a creative, but also as a human and as a parent, how does that register with you? Uh, what Gina just said? Yeah, what Gina just said. Um, first of all, the fact that Gina acknowledged that it is a loaded question, um, and it is, and it's, it's loaded from my standpoint because it is chock full of so many potential responses that one could have to the question, how are you doing? One can respond in any number of different directions. Um, when I hear Gina saying that her 19 year old was pulled over and my 19 year old um, has been pulled over mm. and was also in a, he wrecked his car a few months ago, he was in a car wreck. Um, well, no, he wrecked his car, he was, he's fine. Um, but I really relate to the various responses that one has. Uh, are you okay? Uh, it happened at three in the morning uh, my lady ended up going to where he was. Thank God somebody had stopped, a brother had stopped and stayed with him until my lady and a law enforcement officer got there. It happened that the law enforcement officer was reasonable, a reasonable human being. Mm. Um, so all of that was positive. But um, you know what? I, I think the most honest or authentic thing that I can say in terms of responding to that question is that there is a, I don't want to say a deadening of of um, responses, of, of emotional responses, but there's a blunting mm. of responses just because there are so many responses that one has. Um, to your question, how am I doing? In context of everything that's going on, I'm doing okay. And probably, no, not probably, better than okay. Because, you know, I am wor I'm working right now. 
Um, millions of people are not, as we know. I am able to, therefore, because I'm working, support my family. That is an extraordinary, almost a luxury in these times. Mm -hmm. So I am constantly attempting to take a half a step back from my present and try at, le try at least to figure out perspective. So there, there are these multi steps that one takes. And um, so. No, that's, and that's, that's the most honest and thank you for the honesty. And, and I feel like this Academy Dialogues, the, the, this whole thing was created to give our members a platform to speak their truth and to talk about all of the issues and things that are happening in the community as it relates to art and as it just relates to the human experience. Uh, TJ, oh, how, I, how are I'd you? I'd like to say one more thing before, before you go to TJ and, and, and uh, not to dwell on this and perhaps we can discuss it later in the conversation if, if, it, come, if it comes back around. But when Gina said a few weeks ago she was feeling hope, she was feeling hopeful, my response was, why? And I respond that way, not as a challenge to Gina or anybody else, but I'm curious about, I find myself being curious about what are the components, what were the components of your hopefulness uh, weeks or months ago, whenever it was that you were feeling hopeful, and what are the components that have caused um, your current response? Because that's a whole other, that's a whole other series of conversations. But again, um, uh, that's that's. I just wanted to mention. Well, that. We can we can definitely uh, go to that right after this, right after yeah, TJ. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. TJ, how are you? Uh, as everyone pointed out, it's a, it's, it's a weighted question, right? I, yeah. If I'm going to be completely honest, um, I, I'm processing, right? And active processing, I think there's a wide range of emotions that come with it. Um, it it's... I think for me in terms of like, I have a tremendous amount of anxiety right now. Part of that probably is in a really practical manner. I'm in between projects. So I tend to process through the work and um, it brings my mind at ease to be able to actually take that energy and, and package it and put it in a direction. Um, and without that, uh, the, the ups and downs are very visceral and palpable for me. And it's not, and I don't think it's because of necessarily that, it's not because things have fundamentally changed by any means. It's that the, the, the flaws of this country, there's just the window, had, the curtains have been open and the curtains are open and people I have, I'm, I'm a, appalled by the inability to actually have a, a, an empathetic conversation about who we are as a community. And that I find really um, unnerving. And it's, it's hard to, even with this kind of really diverse coalition of, of allies um, and what allyship looks like in 2020, um, you know, the blowback is equally discouraging. And, um, and I find that we're all processing kind of out loud on our social media feeds. We're all processing internally. And, um, and I don't necessarily think we're having healthy dialogue. I think this is why this is so important because I think it is one of the few forms that where you can actually have a healthy dialogue. But I think yeah, I don't, there's not one, to Delroy's point, I, there's not one dominant emotion. It's kind of a, it's minute to minute, day by day, hour by hour, at least for me. You know, I had a ton of anxiety this morning and then by noon, you know, I spoke, I had did a webinar with a bunch of um, young filmmakers at USC, specifically black women um, that are doing projects, nonfiction projects as a result of the current civil unrest, 
like a lot of the projects are motivated by that. And that brought me a ton of ease, you know, and then now I feel good, you know, and then by tonight, maybe I'll be tripping again, you know, so it's like, it's, it's an ongoing dialogue with myself and the world, right? So. I mean, in the most honest way you said that is, is processing, right? Which means you're neither here nor there and you're in transition. Going back to what Delroy mentioned earlier, and uh, we talk a lot about change, right? The need for change, change, change. But in order for things to change, something has to have changed, right? And so to your point, Delroy, when you were asking Gina and you were saying you were feeling hopeful before, what gave you that, that hope, Gina? What, what brought you to that point, to Delroy's question earlier? I feel, you know, that it was a couple things. I mean, it was certainly, as TJ just mentioned, the allyship felt different this time. It didn't feel, uh, it didn't feel simplistic. It felt um, that there were true allies coming out and putting themselves uh, in harm's way in the way that we've had to by ourselves. Um, within the, uh, you know, Kamala being, chosen was a was a big deal um watching the democratic convention and made me feel hope about what could be um and then within our industry to finally have conversations with people that i've worked with and had those hard conversations you know one in particular why do i need to walk into your offices and not pass one black person from, you know, the reception desk all the way to your corner office. Um, and for the first time, people not being defensive, but actually accepting that they have messed up in a big way and being, um, having a certainty about changing it and knowing why it needed to be changed. Um, so, and then the other thing was, there are so many collectives of, of Black artists coming together from, from all, all of it, from acting, directing, producing, below the line. We're all coming together in such a big way for the first time and seeing and understanding and feeling our power. And that has felt really good because we've never done that before. Um, but uh, I think the thing that changed for me, and it's you know, been been a slow grind back. You know, this this kid, this seventeen year old kid who killed the protesters, uh, and the fact that he is being excused by you know the White House and 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 others. I, I cannot wrap my head around how far we have fallen as a country if when that is happening. And from that point on, it does seem, as TJ mentioned, that we've got this great allyship, but the, but the blow back is starting to feel even stronger. And I just know the fight that we are in, in this moment to literally for survival. When you're, when you're talked about the, the community aspect, I resonated because in our community, like you said before, maybe we weren't as collaborative before or weren't working together as closely. Um, and for all of you, are you noticing that that change in as we go to the younger generation? Are you noticing that they're wanting to work together more? And what can we learn from that? If so? Um, well, I work, you know, I work in nonfiction and our crews are not as big. And, and my creative partner and I, we do a lot of the heavy lifting, like in, from shooting to cutting to everything. Um, but, you know, in the when we're doing, when we're working in the commercial space, we're tend to have obviously bigger crews. The, I, I, you know, I, I think, I think there's still kind of a, um, I still think there's, uh, no pun intended, but there's an old guard with, uh, with, <laughs> within the, within the industry. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of nepotism. Um, and, even even for a younger generation that has the um the like a a vision for how they want to participate in the industry i still think they're met with some really rigid um blockades um and i think i think like a lot of people right they you it's that becomes an opportunity to 
mold how you want to handle that um, and how you want to integrate yourself. And then once you integrate yourself, how do you, what do you do once you integrate yourself within kind of the confines of the industry, even though it's kind of, it's a day to day, you know, organized chaos. But, but I think, I think the, what I, the thing that I am encouraged by is like any institution, the, it's unfortunate, but it's also just the way it is. The, I find that there are younger voices advocating for change and forcing the hand of the, in, of the institution, AKA the industry to examine itself and help facilitate change. Um, that just, that's always been the case with any institution. It's always an outside force, but I love the fact that at least younger voices are not dropping the ball in that regard. And that I find um, really encouraging. And I want to collaborate with those people. <laughs> we talk about, you know, often uh, Nina Simone has this quote, how can you be an artist and not reflect the times, right? And we talk about that responsibility. And I wanted to ask you all, and, and Delroy, starting with you, is it, is it the artist's responsibility alone or is it a collaboration uh, with the system, with the industry, with, with that that it is, in your opinion? Uh, what do I think about that? I think that obviously it is a very personal and intimate choice that one makes for oneself. But my personal, excuse me, my personal response to the question is that yes, I do feel the responsibility. Um, but I want to I want to say that, and this goes back to something you said, Sean, at the beginning of the conversation, um, having to do with. I I, th I think I'm a human being first. Yes. For any other definitions, descriptives, definitions, I'm a human being first, and I want to say first and foremost. Um, so I think. I'm always responding as a human being, albeit that at a certain point, I am filtering my responses through the conduit of my creative self. But going back to the, one of the, when we were talking about our kids, our 19 year olds, I'm responding as a parent, period. Period, the end. That's it, no more and, and, and no less. So, uh, to answer your question, um, personally, yes, I feel a responsibility, but I, I think I'm not defining my various responses as an artist. I think I'm defining my responses as a human being on the planet. Does that make sense? That makes all of the sense of the world. TJ, I would say to you, following up with that, how does that impact the way that you approach film? You know, we saw you won the Oscar for Undefeated, which follows a Memphis football team having a over 100 year losing streak. And you, that power of, of them seeing themselves as that, and then what happened when you came into it, how did that affect your approach to coming into working with them? How did it affect my approach in terms of? In terms of you're working with, you know, the power of imagery, right? You're working. Yeah with a team who sees themselves as losers for about a hundred years and right. the decision to highlight that and how that invertly changed the power of how they saw themselves. Cause they ended up winning after that. Well, they did not win this. Well, I'd be giving away part of the movie, but in the season that we covered, they still were on a losing streak, but the, I mean, I, I, so the challenge with undefeated was, that you know when you do a verite film you're trying to express to the audience at least the way my filmmaking partner and i see it the emotional experience that you have right because you you know we embedded ourselves with this um high school football team in north memphis for the the, the senior year of the first group of students that came in and reshaped the program with this gentleman named Bill Courtney, who was the coach. So it's the, the way with which these students see themselves, we can't take credit for that. That's very much of the, the Bill and the volunteers that created a program that were committed to the, to the students and to the student athletes. Um, 
and we're not doing it for selfish purposes, but rather, you know, the, the coach had moved to North Memphis, he moved his business there, and as a result, he wanted to give back to the community. So he was a permanent fixture of the community. Um, but the, so the film can't take credit for that, but our job was to go in and um, create, can we capture the essence of what the relationships were? So a lot of the biggest challenge with Undefeated in particular was you've got a North Memphis, which is 99.9% .9 black, and you've got a white coach, volunteer coach, coming in from East Memphis. And one of the things that attracted us to the, to the story to begin with was one of the players was spending part of his time with the coaches in East Memphis living there throughout the week and then living uh, with his grandmother in North Memphis during the weekends. And it, we were, it was an opportunity to use either this particular student or the team's story to kind of explore race in class and use this experience as a reflection of how we talk about race and class in, in the country. But then the, the, the football narrative itself became so, so good and so fascinating that that's still present, but through the conduit of a, of a football story. But the bigger challenge was, you know, I'm, I naturally go into something like that going like, you know, this particular coach, what are, he's got ulterior motives. Is he kind of like given the hard sell on, on his relationship with the students? And the challenge was after spending time with them was that there is a fundamental, very real, um, uh, very healthy relationship between the coach and the players. Now our job is to make sure that we are not, we recognize the blind spots and the baggage that an audience is gonna come with that says, is this a white knight story? Which is a 100% a valid question. So how do we take that and say, good analysis, but if we take it a step further and we create themes that are a little bit more about like fatherhood, you actually transcend that. And that was, um, that became, and a challenge creatively, but it was, it was something that was very necessary to get a film for people to, to actually look beyond um, race and class in the most, and, and acknowledge it at the same time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. um, you're not, not supposed to acknowledge it, but then can you say, oh, wow, this is a real relationship. And as a result, if we can get that baggage out of the way, then you're actually looking at a coming of age film. You know, these young men that are transitioning um, from end of high school into the early stages of manhood. And that's really what, what, the, what the film was about in a space created by volunteers that allowed them to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that was huge. And, and this is slightly tangential, but that is one thing I find I'm always attracted to, which is so rarely seen, is finding spaces for men, and particularly men of color, and particularly black men, to show their vulnerabilities um, and feel comfortable doing that. So our job at that point is to continue to to express to the audience what our feel, what we experienced um, through the emotions of it and through the storytelling of it, um, and then preserve the integrity of the space and the vulnerability that they gave us and allowed us to capture, to capture in, in the making of that film. Um, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Gina, we were talking and um, that, that idea of the power of imagery, right? And this idea of self identity. And you've been open about your childhood and growing up in your community and kind of really being the only one or not really seeing people who look like you. How did that affect the way that you approach film? I mean, it, it certainly absolutely defines it. Um, understanding, knowing very early the power of, of film and imagery, um, you know, just in, in quick context, you know, adopted by a Salvadorian mother and an Irish father and, um, and raised in, in really all white area. And so growing up, 
just never seeing myself reflected and not even in my own family. And, you know, that could do a number on your self-esteem, certainly. And thank God for sports, which, you know, gave me the applause that, that I was, you know, so desperately craving. Um, but I, I remember distinctly um, uh, being 17 years old and, and uh, going to see the movie, I forgot what movie I was going to see, but the trailer for She's Gotta Have It came on. And uh, looking up there and, and Nola Darling and, and am I like Nola, you know, who she is? No, but it was me seeing someone who looked up, uh, looked like me up on that big screen and uh, I was floored. And I, I've never forgotten that feeling. And for me, from that moment and knowing that I wanted to tell stories and, and get into film and television that I wanted to give an audience, especially a black audience, that feeling that I had. And so for me, my work has been a fight to to center our stories and, and tell stories in every genre, but through our lens. And um, yeah, and I'm the first audience. So I'm kind of writing what I want to see. And then my hope is then that I can inspire and create characters that we can be um, aspire to be. And from there, the world can see us in all these different ways and see the breadth of our humanity and be inspired by us as well. And, and when you, we spoke, um, you were also, I've heard you say that when you are able to see yourself, then you're able to see yourself and what that does and how it can alter and change someone's entire life. Um, and obviously the opportunity and versatility, right? So when we're talking about telling our stories in black cinema, while also knowing that it is for the larger audience, it can be a black story and be universal as well. Um, Delroy, have you, you've been such a cultural icon in, in a lot of Spike Lee's early films and a staple, a staple in the community in which you, in which you mean <laughs> to, to us. And I've also seen your versatility in just, there was a time I think you weren't in film and you were just performing in theater. Have you always had that, been able to do that intersection? Did you see us there in theater to draw you to that? Because you represent something so magical in that space as well. First of all, um, were I a more um, 21st century individual, I would have gone on the internet and looked up TJ and Gina, and I did not. Therefore, um, TJ, I did not know that you, that the film Undefeated, which really moved me, and when you first, I did not know that you were involved with Undefeated. So I want to say congratulate, not only congratulations to you as an audience, but um, an interesting thing happened when you first mentioned that you, you, were, you are involved in that film. I got goosebumps, goosebumps. And the reason that I got goosebumps was because that the depth of uh, the extent to which that film moved me for a whole variety of reasons. So to the extent that I gave Gina props, I want to give you props right now. That's that's the first. And if I if I were more on the ball, I would have looked it up before we got on this interview, and 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 I would have led with that. Right. That's one thing. So props, man. Major props to you. Thank um, you. When Gina, when you were speaking about your upbringing, there were a couple of um, aspects that I related to. Um, I was not formally adopted, but I, but I did spend, when I was very, very young, I, did, I was taken in by a family that were not my biological uh, uh, parents. And I also was spent a very significant time in my formative years going to all white schools in all white neighborhoods. Um, and so I really when you start talking about not, not seeing yourself reflect, reflected back to yourself, I get it 6,000%. But as it relates to the making of work, as I'm sitting here listening to your, to your, 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 your narrative, it occurred to me that what happened with me was, is that the aspects that I felt as a young person and the pain, deep seated pain that was um, 
visited on me as a result of being a black kid in an all white, <clears throat> excuse me, neighborhood, a black kid in all white schools and all that that comes with. Um, I have been able to use in my work the, the individual, the aloneness, the, um, the individual, what's the word? Um, the, the, the fact of feeling like one is alone in the world, mm -hmm. um, I have um, been able to use um, really constructively, not without neuroses, not without pain and all the rest of that, but in the final analysis, one of the foundational aspects of, of, of my career, frankly, is the fact that I have been able to mine those things um, for a creative good. Um, so I'm not quite sure what I'm saying other than hearing you inspired me, hearing you tell your story, uh, Gina, A, inspired me, B, caused me to reflect uh, on myself. And it, these are not reflections I haven't had before, mm -hmm. but just seeing them in a slightly different, uh, different light. And being able now, all these years later, to uh, acknowledge, embrace how <laughs> the pain of my childhood, I was, I've been able to uh, <laughs> use and utilize as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like big time, frankly, big time. Is there a specific role, Delroy, uh, that that you were able to really use that the most? And continue using it, continue using it. Uh, um, the other thing I want to, I need to add in this moment is um, the fact I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that um, <clears throat> I feel extremely fortunate that I am working uh, and I do. Um, and this goes, um, Sean, to your question of how are you feeling? Um, added to the fact that I am working, I'm working on a project. And the last project that I did with Spike, um, Spike's project and the project that I'm working on currently are both narratives in which we as African descended people are front and center. So the narrative is being told very, very, very much from our point of view. And that enhances the extent to which I feel, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna use this hackneyed and overused word, but blessed, because I am. Um, and the fact that these projects, and I, look, we're in the middle of, we, we just started working on this film that I'm doing right now, so I don't know what the finished result will be, but what I, what I can say is that um, working in the process of doing this current work, and absolutely, working in the process of having made five bloods and the fact that we were front and center um, is again, another hackneyed and overused word, but a gift that particularly now in, in, in not only in the met the, in, in the America that we're living in, but the world that we're living in, the fact that I get to be a part of, <clears throat> excuse me, these projects that have nothing to do with filtering through somebody else's gaze or filtering through somebody else's experience, what the story is, that's an extraordinary thing. And it does make, for me as a creative person, as a human being on the planet, it makes a very profound and positive difference to how I negotiate my world with all of its ugliness and, 
and the fact that we as African descended people are being battered. We are so, we are so, so much being battered right now. Um, but I have, as a human being, as a human, as a creative person, I have these islands, these oases of affirmation for who I am as a, as an African descended person, as a creative person, that not only can I experience, but then I can share with the rest of the world, which is extraordinary. And it is said that in the um, specific is the universal, and you used the, the term, the word universal a little earlier in the conversation. And I have gotten to, I get to be a part of, I am, I've gotten the gift of being a part of very specifically examining something through the lens of who I am as a black individual, sharing that with the world and hopefully affirming the humanity, not the black humanity, the humanity that exists in those journeys. And that's extraordinary. Mm. Yeah. Beyond extraordinary. I, I don't have the words to. You know, it's, I mean, I've, obviously there'd be no reason I, I would know. I had no idea about, you know, your upbringing and that's so fascinating to me because, you know, there's always been a reason that I've gravitated towards your work and um, in, in everything you, there is, and I know you just said humanity, not black humanity, but for me in every role that you've played, you've always, for me, represented black manhood and that it wasn't, it's not just dignity and strength, but this innate vulnerability that might be from the way that you grew up and, and the things that you talked about. But given that all of those things made, made a black manhood for me, as opposed to, you know, so many stereotypes that were given. And um, so I'm grateful to you for that. And, you know, I, I would say congrats on the five bloods, but it's really your whole body of work has always been that for me. Um, so Thank again, you. it's fascinating to hear where some of that has come from. Thank you. We're talking a lot about owning your stories, which is what I captured from what you were saying, Delroy, is I was being in the forefront and behind the scenes, narrating and showing and sharing our stories and how important it is to have that authentic through line, as well as uh, documenting our stories. Uh, TJ, which you've documented LA 92, which has been a, a story and a staple in our community. Talk to me about LA 92 and what you've learned about that and where you think we are right now. And if there is any change at all. Yeah, um, for those who haven't seen LA 92, it's, it's, a, it's a film about the civil unrest, commonly known as kind of the Rodney King riots, but I prefer civil unrest. Um, in 92, after Rodney King was um, beaten by four motorists and nearly murdered, and then, uh, sorry, beaten by four cops and nearly murdered, and then the cops um, uh, uh, getting off on the trial. And then it became, to this day, the most um, violent, uh, monetarily speaking, the most uh, violent uh, uh, civil unrest in American history. Um, the, the, the project was made at the 24, in preparation for the 25 year anniversary of the unrest. And we knew that there's gonna be a number of films coming out. Um, it was, we did not conceive of the project. It was a production company that came up with the idea, sold it to a, a network and they wanted us to direct it. And um, they sent over a sizzle and in the sizzle, they had mined some other early archive. And, uh, and there's a kind of a moment in the sizzle where there's a gentleman from South, South Central uh, that was captured on film within his own community. And he's kind of waving a hammer around and he's, uh, he's yelling at the top of his lungs and he's, um, he's very, very emotional and he's crying and he's saying he had just been looted. Um, and he's basically yelling around by, to, to within his community, why steal from me? I come from the ghetto too, you call this activism, you know, and he's, you see a man falling apart on the camera. And 
for us, that was that the vulnerability in that particular moment was the um, impetus of the approach, which is, can you tell these events only using archive um, and preserve the integrity of the emotion that people experienced in that moment in time? So can you create an experiential film and not one that's kind of a talking head documentary. I find that oftentimes um, when we're looking at critical moments in our history, because it's happened and because there's a, there's a person giving it analysis, um, it creates a buffer between the audience and the experience that fundamentally changed people's lives. So the film, uh, there's a long way of just saying the film is a, is a feature doc only constructed out of archive. And the idea is to bring, to create an immersive experience um, for audiences that may have lived through it or, um, or for younger audiences that, for younger generations that don't know anything about it. And the, we start the film with, um, uh, with a prologue of, of Watts. And then at the end of the film, we, it gets pretty editorialized where we're kind of intercutting between 65 watts, the, the civil unrest in watts, and the civil unrest in 92. And so the dominant theme of the film um, is that these events are cyclical. Um, it's baked into a system that, um, a system of violence and a system of oppression, um, that will never go away until we actually are able to have people in positions that have fundamentally hold the reins of the system change the system itself. So to answer your question, is there, what am I seeing any differently in 2020 is, you know, both on my social media feed and in Twitter and you know, when things really popped off in LA, I, I was in the middle of cutting a, our next film, but I just couldn't, I couldn't resist. I had to go down and like experience in real time what a protest looks like during an epidemic. Like it's, it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So in all three instances, what I'm seeing on my phone, what I'm experiencing in person, what I'm reading in the news, um, the one standout thing is the diverse coalition of of faces and um what seems to be allyship now um i think is fundamentally different than anything we've ever seen uh, and when i when i say diverse coalition i don't mean um black and white i mean latino asian american native representation all speaking out against and for and on behalf of the black community actually showing like true allyship and, and empathy because there's, it felt like there's a fundamental understanding that if when, when, when one member of our community is attacked, that we all suffer as a result. And then we can lift, um, lift other communities up, we are all gonna also benefit from it. It's, it's really simple, it's really. However, having said that, that is a fundamental difference, but then my, my, the, the part that I feel um, that I'm a little bit more wary about is because we do live in a day and age where everyone, you know, is almost like a walking brand, right, through social media or whatever it may be, is, is, is black pain, is that a fad? And is it, is it, is it something that it's, um, you are speaking to your community by showing support because that is something that is what you're supposed to do. And then what happens when um, another black man gets murdered and on mm. camera and then another and then another and then another, does your, does your support fade away because the dominant community is no longer talking about it? Um, right. Does your support only mm. stop because you don't know what to do outside of just posting something. Um, That's right. Yes. The, so, so to answer your question, there is, 
there's a fundamental change in terms of what the allies look like. Um, I think it's too soon to tell where are we going. Mm. Um, and as we yeah. talked about earlier today, the, the, I'm encouraged by, especially the younger voices, um, Amen. and their actual very active, palpable participation. Yeah. Um, I'm very much so discouraged by the growing blowback that's mm. creating even more of a divisiveness and, and our inability to have a healthy, nuanced conversation from, from different ideologies that usually fundamentally kind of want the same things, you know, in terms of, and, and oftentimes just don't feel like they're getting heard. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I, I think the theme of LA-92 is alive and well. I think we're in a we're in a cycle mm -hmm. of um, a very violent cycle, which is also just the history of this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what happens next is I think only time time will tell. That's not to say don't bow out from really trying to um, have empathetic conversations, even with those that disagree with you, because that's actually what needs to happen. Yeah. Um, we need to understand where the vitriol and the hate comes from. Um, for those that, let's be honest, for, I don't want to stereotype, but oftentimes for people that, what feels like they don't even want people that look like me or that are darker than me to even be in their, con they're, they're in the same community in the same country. So. And I think what I hear you saying is like that, we need healing through conversation. And in order to have healing, there has to be a space where we can speak our truths and those truths have to be heard. It's not about you understanding or agreeing with those truths. It's just about we need to be heard. And when you speak about where we are in the industry and the landscape of organizations and companies and Black Lives Matter, I've never seen so many people screaming Black Lives Matter <laughs> that are not Black right now. And to your point, I'm like, what does that mean? And that brings me to my so my question is, what is the role and the responsibility of an ally, in your opinions? What, is, what does that look like? And, and, and knowing that allies can show their advocacy in different ways, like you said, TJ, they can show and post online, right? But is that a fad? Is that when we're no longer talking about hashtag whoever, um, is that gone? What, what is your, the ideas of the roles of allies? Delroy, were you going to say something? Yeah. Um, that, that's the fundamental question. What does alliance truly look like? And um, TJ, when you said, is black pain a fad? <clears throat> I think that is the subject, the phenomenon, the, 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 the thing that people who want to be allies have to answer for themselves so that it is not a fad. And that brings me to um, a short passage that I wanted to read, I want to I wanted share, that I just read recently. Um, you all uh, live in Los Angeles, is that, is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. So I, 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 I only reason I, the only reason I, <clears throat> ask that because I, I do not live in Los Angeles and that doesn't make me better. I just, just geographically, it, it's connected to what I'm about to read. Mm -hmm. So the question, and I'm sorry if I sound like a, you know, a college lecturer right now, but um, I want to ask, um, does everybody on this call know who uh, Dijon Kizzy is? Diz, Dijon Kizzy, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I'm not I didn't, I, I didn't know who he, who he was either until I read this article. So let me just bear with me one second. In late August, uh, this is from the New York, the Sunday New York Times, uh, September 13. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in late August, Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies shot a black man. Uh, mm -hmm. Black man, man's name is Dijon Kizzy whom they had stopped for a suspected traffic violation as he rode his bicycle. 
He became the seventh man killed by deputies in Los Angeles since the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis on Memorial Day weekend. On the same afternoon, state, legislate, state legislators in Sacramento raced to the end of their 2020 session. The most significant police reform measure heralded in the days of the Black Lives Matter marches that filled the streets did not even come up for a vote. That to me, and it's a longer article, but just those opening paragraphs, those opening two paragraphs are profoundly indicative of the potential fadism, as you say, TJ, of black pain. The fact that none of us on this call, myself included, knew who Dijon Kizzy was, is. He stopped for a suspected traffic violation riding his bicycle. So, um, and the fact that the state legislator, state legislature, um, um, clearly knew nothing about this, and it had no relationship to whatever legislation was on the books having to do with potential police reform. For me, that goes right to the heart of the potential fatism of black pain and how when things are no longer um, top of mind for people, it very quickly reverts to business as usual. Mm. Um, so to your question, <clears throat> excuse me, to your question, Sean, what does alliance look like? Mm -hmm. I think that anybody, anybody on the planet, not just in America, but anybody on the planet who views themselves or wants to view themselves as an ally of black people, people of color, I think you have to ask yourself the question, am I in it for the long haul? Or am I in it um, for the next month or two or three? Because the reality is um, <laughs> as we know, it's much longer than the next month, two months, three months, next uh, year, two years, three years. So I think um, allies have to ask themselves a question, the very hard question. Um, uh, am I down? Uh, how long am I down for? To what extent um, am I willing to negotiate my own humanity and my own human impulses? And that's important negotiating one's own human impulses. Because we as humans, in, it, it is inherently human that we go on to the next. You know, we deal with whatever, but then we go on to the next, that's human. But I think for anybody who really wants to be an ally, you, I think the question then becomes, to what extent, how long am I in this for? Black people don't have a choice because it's our everyday reality. Yes. For anybody who wants to be an ally, I think they have to challenge themselves with the question, <clears throat> how long am I down for? How long am I in this for? What am I prepared to, to do? And also, On the what long, are they... in, in, in long term, in, in, mm -hmm. over the long haul. I'm sorry, Gina. Yeah. No, just to co-sign this also, what are you willing to give up. I mean, there's this great right. quote that I read, which was, you know, when you're in a position of power, equity feels like oppression. So when, you know, folks start to feel that, are they going to be in there for the long haul? Or are they going to suddenly realize, oh, I've got to give up something and it's not worth it. That's where my fear lies that, that we, I feel like we're getting to that point. Um, and that article you just read is, is absolutely indicative of that. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
I don't know. I, I feel I think it's a good question because I find myself wrestling with it all all the time. Um, and you know, on a little bit more of an existential level, it's it's a it that each individual has to be willing to do a lot of hard self analysis. Like there has to be a lot of hard truths that they have to face about themselves and their relationship to society and, and, and their yes. community. There's like the, the, funny enough, I mean, it's, it's nothing new by any means, but for some reason, uh, you know, Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised has been top of mind for me lately because very much so as I wrestle with my own involvement in what my participation looks like um, not in bettering, not just in bettering our industry, but, you know, what's my, my own activism and participation in, in the world look like. But the reason that has resonance with me, right, is the crux of what he's saying is it won't be televised because everyone has to have a revolution within which you cannot capture. Um, and I feel like the idea of that needs to be is also at the center of what allyship looks like. You have to keep pushing yourself and challenging yourself to understand and be willing and even get to the place of participating um, in, in, in a protest um, where you're participating with empathy and you're participating by opening your ears, right? That's leadership to me is listening. Um, but that takes someone who's willing to get over their own ego. Right, and that's that personal revolution that has to happen, um, and that's to me that's fundamental. Otherwise, that's also how we continue this kind of cycle, and also like get fooled by just like bad, you know, nonsense news and nonsense ideas of you know that equity is taking something away from you. Like, what the fuck is that? You know. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I'm sure <laughs> we'll add something really quickly, and that is the um, um, alliance. And I, I'm perhaps stating the obvious, and this is very element, elementary, perhaps. But alliance, as we know, can take many forms. And um, for those of us or those of you <clears throat> who are not comfortable with marching in the streets, that's okay. I think that that's, that's okay. I think that the question when one starts to um, examine oneself, and as you say, TJ, I mean, you challenge oneself um, to define for oneself what that alliance looks like. The potentially beautiful thing, quote unquote, is that it can take many forms, right? As long as one is doing something on an ongoing basis to enact change. Um, I, I would say, um, TJ and, and Gina, all of us, <clears throat> we may or may not be marching in the streets, um, but we are engaging, I'm not going to say revolution, I'm going to say change agents. We are engaging, we are, we are, um, we are manifesting the notion of becoming change of, of, of living change agents through our work on, 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 on one very fundamental level. Each and every one of us, um, that's not marching in the streets. I mean, maybe some of us march, maybe some of us do not, but I don't want to, and I'm sure you do not, um, undervalue, underestimate the power, you know, of cinema, of communication, and that through our work, our engaging our work, we are impacting, frankly, the world. And I do not believe that is hyperbole. Um, I believe it to be true. I think you're absolutely right, Delroy, and I, I'm sure, I'm not sure, but I got a lot of questions around when the whole unrest was happening and people, allies, uh, or wanting to be allies, asking, how can I participate? What can I do? What can I learn? What can I read? What can I watch? And it's like, 
it's not my history you need to learn, it's yours. Mm. <laughs> mm. Learn about my history. I need you to learn about your history. I need you to understand what your part, and not you specifically, you weren't around, but your, your family's part, I need you to understand because with that understanding of your own history comes what you spoke about, TJ, which is accountability. And then once you understand what that is, I need you to go educate your other friends, and then I need you to amplify that. And that's the power that you have as an ally. You have the power to have those spaces and have those relationships that maybe we don't necessarily have, but it is your job. It is your job to not learn my history. It's your job to learn yours. And then it's your job to not only educate everyone around you, but to amplify that message because in that message is where there is change. And um, I just wanted to say to you all here, thank you all so much for your participation today. And to your point, Delroy, the entire reason for the Academy Dialogues, again, was because to have these conversations centered around filmmaking, centered around truth, centered around race relations, gender equality, and um, you are all affecting the world. And we are all watching and we are all thankful and grateful for your contribution, not only as humans, uh, but as filmmakers to this cinema, black cinema, universal cinema, all cinema, because you guys do all cinema. Uh, so I want to thank you all so much on behalf of the Academy for joining this conversation on Academy Dialogues. Listen, one really, really quick thing. Um, at the beginning of this session, you said you referred to uh, myself, TJ, Gina, as, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you spoke about the fact that we are all at the forefront of something. Did you say that? It was something like that. You're, I said affecting, uh, I want to say probably said affecting culture or yes. works. Yeah, in. something along those lines. And when you said that, um, I have to tell you <clears throat> that, again, internally, my response was, uh, okay, I hope I'm affecting culture, <laughs> whatever it was that you said. Um, what I'm aware of, and now this is important as it relates to fadism. Mm. What I'm aware of is that I am having a moment in my career. I, I, and I'm not being coy. I'm not trying to underplay anything. I'm having a moment right now, specifically as it relates to the Five Bloods. And I, I'm proud of the film. I'm proud of the moment. I'm embracing the moment. But my job, and probably for all of us, my job is. A, to acknowledge that moment, to embrace the specialness of that moment. And it's beautiful, it's been beautiful, it's been extraordinary. But my job now is to keep working yeah. and not get caught up in whatever that moment has been, may become, um, I wanna embrace it, but the larger, responsibility that I have <laughs> is to keep working, keep being. So, and I think for all of us, so that one does not get sucked into uh, fatism. Hmm. So that's all. Yeah, was, so 100%. yeah for all of us, right? 100%, 100%, yeah. for all of us. That's the, I mean, just, Keeping keeping on is hard enough, right? It is, it is, and, it, and it's the most, I mean, for me, it's the most important thing, right? Is we won the Oscar at a really young age and you start to, you're listening to the way with which other people are assigning your identity. And that's yeah, a really slippery slope um, to lose track of your own voice, because it was early in the development of even discover, I'm still kind of trying to figure out what my voice is, you know? And that's the part that's where the, the work is, right? I want to- That's right. I want a career, not a- Amen. A little like blip Amen. on the timeline. That's right. Amen. Amen. Myself. <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, anyhow. Um, no, that was, I'm, we using all this. So I, I, love, I love that because like you said, your voice and noticing, knowing that your voice can change, you know what I mean? And you can change and want to- And should be allowed to change. Yes. And your voice should be allowed to change, you yes. know, as opposed to being in a box. It should, yeah. 
your voice should be allowed to change. Yeah, and when you and when you spoke about, I heard you speak a little bit about how your hesitation towards the role in the Five Bloods initially because he was a Trump supporter, right? And yeah, how, yeah. And how you sat with that for a little bit, and understanding, oh, that needs to be told too, and mm -hmm, so you sure. use your voice to amplify something that still needs to be told, and that story right. still needs to be told because that's still clearly the human experience, you know? And so right. your voice can be allowed to change your, we're all artists, you know, in any, in any sense of the word, if you're creating anything, if you're living in this world, you are creating something, you're an artist, and it's your that's job right. to evolve, to reinvent, to create new space, to figure out what the pipeline is, to, you know, to create a space where you're mentoring and bringing in new people, but it's your job to continue finding yourself because that is your job to then reflect it back to everybody else. Amen. So, so true. Yeah. So y'all, let's get off because clearly we will be talking forever. God bless y'all. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure, guys. Thank you for watching Academy Dialogues. For more videos, please subscribe to our channel.